This morning's lesson is five layers of defense against Satan. And to supplement this morning's lesson, I encourage you this evening to read Ephesians 6 as it goes hand in hand with many of the things we're going to be speaking of this morning. But we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5 where Daniel just read for us. So open your Bibles. We're going to be there uh, predominantly for this morning's lesson. It's going to be our core and we're going to have some things orbiting around it, but this is going to be our main text this morning. We're going to be looking at the reality that there is an enemy. We have an adversary who is looking to destroy, to devour uh, us. And in addition to the reality that we have an enemy, we have an infinitely more powerful God who has more than abundantly adequately equipped us to be properly defended against him. So we are going to be looking at five layers of defense that come from God that defend us against Satan. There's more than just these five layers, but we're going to be looking at the five layers that are in these two verses in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses five or verses 8 through 9. So the first one, verse 8, chapter 5, is be sober-minded. That is to be having clear thinking, properly functioning and working mind, uh, sobriety. And so since we're going to be having these five different layers, we're going to have each one of these, we're going to do a little hand motion to help remember these five different layers of defense. So the first one, one, is clear thinking. So everybody do this with me. This is clear thinking. This is our first layer of defense, clear thinking, this sobriety. Now, when you hear the word sobriety, I don't know about you, but the first thing I think about is, uh, is not consuming alcohol to be sober or to not have any, be, not being under the influence. I think of DUIs and the consequence that those cause in our world. You know, 30 people a day die in the United States alone from drunk driving. 11,000 a year here in the United States from drunk driving. And so we recognize the gravity and the, and the consequence of when this is not working properly, it can really hurt and damage um, and kill people. Now, we're operating this body in this life, and when we don't have sober-mindedness, it also causes pain and destruction in people's lives around us. So we're going to use the driving, the drunk driving analogy to parallel similar dynamics we have when we're not having sobriety in our minds. So let's have a driving analogy here of sober-mindedness um, while living in this, in this world. The first is, while you're being distracted, because there's other things that compromise your driving other than alcohol. Uh, texting and driving. Um, I don't know how often you're tempted to do this. I know I am tempted to. Um, I, and when we're doing this, we're voluntarily giving our attention to things that can wait. And we do this, we're tempted to do this very often and in many ways. What about anger, road rage? There's a, uh, a slang word that's becoming more often used, and that is being triggered. I don't know if you've heard that before. But being triggered, usually I don't care too much for, the, for newer slang words. Maybe that's a sign I'm getting older. Um, but this word triggered, I think, is really, really good because... When to say that you're triggered, when you know somebody says something or something happens, all of a sudden, oh, you explode and you just have this outburst of, of anger. That shows that there was already tension built up like a mouse trap. If you get a brand new mouse trap at Walmart and you just pick it off the shelf, it's not going to snap at you because the lever hasn't been pulled all the way back and set into place. And then when it's triggered, it snaps and it has a deadly force to a mouse and can hurt your finger. But this idea of being triggered is that there's unresolved, built-up tension. And so anger, unresolved anger, which causes triggering, or where it's triggering then causes it to explode, that anger, that gives you a clouded mind. In my Christian counseling class, our, our teacher showed us that anger is temporary insanity because you have chemicals going off in your mind and you are not talking and interacting with sobriety. He said, if you don't believe me, record yourself, video yourself when you're angry, having a conversation with somebody, and then watch it when you're sober. And you will see 
like, who is this person? That's not me. And so our sobriety is compromised when we are in a perpetual state of anger. We have unresolved anger. Next is exhausted, people falling asleep at the will, where we have just pushed ourselves too far. We have not adequately gotten the proper amount of rest. And so we cannot clearly react or see, and we know many um, accidents are caused from exhaustion. What about uh, self-centeredness? You know, where you're focused on yourself in the middle of driving, for example, and nothing, nothing against makeup, don't get me wrong, but the idea of I'm going to take care of myself at the risk of myself and others is a very deadly mindset. And then for all of us that live here in Alaska and, and have survived the winters here, we know that sometimes the, the traffic is just disastrous to be out there. And sometimes we know the weather's bad, but we go out there anyways, and we put ourselves in circumstances we know, okay, this is going to be really rugged, and I'm gonna, but I really want to go do this, or I, I think I have to go to work, and um, maybe we need to call in and just not go in that day. Maybe we need to make less money. Maybe we need to not put ourselves in circumstances that are going to be, that have high risk of, of disaster. So we can choose many of the times the environments that, we can, that we're going to put ourselves in. So maybe we need to slow down or just not go. So how do we regain our sobriety? Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent, or if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. So to be sober-minded, we think about these things. And we don't stop thinking about them. We keep thinking about these and we increase in sobriety by doing so. So that's number one. Number two, number two is to be watchful. So here's the hand motion for number two. Two is to be watchful. So everybody do this with me, be watchful, okay? So clear thinking, be watchful. So how, I think of um, watchfulness. How, when if you're walking out here in Alaska in the woods, uh, and you're by yourself, and it's kind of quiet, and you hear a, a twig or branch snap, you know, 10, 15 yards behind you in the woods, you're gonna look, and you're gonna kind of have all attention trying to discern what is that? What, what was that? We don't have that same level of watchfulness when we hear something rummaging around in Walmart on the other aisle next to us. We're, we're not concerned about that noise. Well, what's changed? Well, because we're in the woods, we know that there are bears and other animals here in Alaska. And so we are more watchful. We're more attentive in that circumstance. So we need to understand also, as we're going to see in the context of this passage, that there is a predator, that there is an enemy, and there is a certain high level of watchfulness we are required to have. And, and, to, and what specifically are we to watch? 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, for by doing so you will save both yourself and, your, and the hearers. Paul talking to Timothy, um, a fellow preacher. But this, this point of keeping a close watch on yourself and on the teaching and the protection that comes from that is essential because Satan operates through lies. He operates through lies, and he operates through deceit and, and help be, trying to get you to look at yourself, perceive your way, yourself in an untrue way. So looking at yourself in comparison to the word is what we're supposed to be watchful for um, against Satan. Uh, a great example of watchfulness in a natural way, I think of meerkats. If you've ever watched meerkats, it's really phenomenal because they work together, and they're so attentive, they're so watchful, and they're all looking at different directions, and if they spot a predator, they alert each other, and they all run away safely. And so I look at them as a great example of natural examples of watchfulness. Now, this next part of this passage shows us our adversary, um, that our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. This devour is means to swallow whole, swallow completely. And we have to remember that Satan is not just the demon and the angel in our conscience, not just the demon side saying, hey, do this, go do this thing that you know is bad. 
He's not just trying to get us to do bad things. He's not trying to just make us feel guilty. He's not trying to just stumble us. He's trying to devour. He's trying to kill. He's a murderer from the beginning. And he's the father of lies. And everything he does is in a motive, in, with the intention of devouring. And so understanding Satan's motives, he's not just trying to make you feel bad. He's trying to devour you through lies. So now number three... Number three is resisting him, resisting Satan. In the Greek, this word is anthitimai. And what this means is to oppose, to resist, or to literally stand up against. I think of, it's kind of a cliche thing, but I think of a wedding and whoever is officiating the wedding saying, is there anybody here who opposes this gathering and then someone says i oppose and just i've never seen that happen now now i'd kind of like to see it happen just to say i've seen it happen <laughs> somebody talked to me afterwards about where this comes from where that tradition of asking if anyone i mean does that do anything if somebody does oppose questions for later but it's that like this is going to be really awkward and saying no i oppose i'm against this and everyone's gonna be like oh, what and it's, and it causes this big drama in a similar way, we are to oppose the lies of the world. And it is going to be awkward. It's going to be unpopular because the majority are going to be buying into these lies and, and, and binding themselves to these lies. And we are to resist that. We are to stand out against the lies that uh, Satan is, is propagating. Resist is such a great word. I think of resistance movements uh, throughout history, different governments and nations that have fallen from the tenacity of you know, freedom fires, resistances in there. Even our own country, you know, in the, at the t Boston Tea Party, and just the the courage it takes to step out and say, "No, I'm going to reject this uh, this this thing that is trying to subdue us." You fight against it, and there's a certain tenacity that's required for resistance. We are to fight against the lies that Satan is so dogmatically trying to uh, subdue the world with. At Exit Glacier in Seward, we went, we've gone there several times, and every time I go there, I laugh when I see this, and I hope every time you go there, um, you will laugh as well. And there's this, uh, I'm going to show it to you here in just a moment, there's this sign about warnings and like things to do if you encounter different animals, and most of it's pretty great, um, but there's one part of it that I just, I just shake my head every time that I see it. And, it's, uh, and here it is. Uh, here at the bottom where it talks about bears, it says if, if, you fight, you can, if, if a bear attacks, you fight a black bear. If a grizzly bear attacks you, play dead. If it starts to eat you, fight back. <laughs> every time I read that, I, I think, well, no, duh. Like... <laughs> Oh, he's already eaten one leg. Oh, do I keep playing dead? Like, what do I... How, how would you not fight back? And I've never been attacked by a bear, and so I, I guess I can't say, you know, how do you weigh, okay, do I play dead or do I fight back? Is he eating me or is he just biting me? Like, how do you weigh that? How do you, like, rationalize that in the moment? I don't know. Um, so sage advice here, obviously. But if you're being devoured, fight back. Okay, I got that. And in the similar, and the reason I put this up here is just like we talked about, Satan is seeking to devour. You fight back. You don't let that happen. You don't let him consume you. You fight back like a grizzly bear that's trying to eat you. You you leave nothing out. You just go full throttle, tenacious. You fight tenaciously against the thing that is trying to devour you. Turn your in your Bibles to First John chapter five. I think this is a very relevant passage in, uh, to this. First John chapter five. We're going to read verses eighteen through twenty-one. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 
And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and the eternal life. So the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, but when we're born of God, we are protected by him. He can't even touch us. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one through his lies. It's through his lies that he has power over this, this world, but we are not of this world because, because of Christ. So how, but how specifically do we resist these lies of Satan? How do we how do, we do it? Uh, we're told in James uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, that we are to submit ourselves then to God and to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And the way we resist him is by coming near to God, and then God will come near to us. So we oppose Satan by running to God, and Satan will flee. He runs away scared, and he runs away scared not because of us, but because of God, who we now have access to because of Christ. That, tor- that curtain is torn. We can connect to God now in a way that we couldn't before Christ, and Satan now runs scared because of our connection to, to God that we have through Jesus. Now, some common wisdom, some common sense from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, uh, verse 12, says a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And so I want to um, read you two passages with this in mind, and this is going to get us ready for an illustration I'm going to do for you. Uh, and that is Ephesians 4, 1 through 7, and Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 4. So this is going to be kind of a prologue to um, an illustration and um, a visual aid that we're going to have for you here. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, Therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Therefore, there is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And now in Colossians, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are of the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So the reason I have these up before we do this illustration is because the common sense of the threefold cord is not easily broken. How many cords do we have woven through us as Christians? How tightly are we wrapped and how many threads has God given us to be bound with him? And how strong is that cord? If three is not easily broken, how many cords do we have and how strong is that? So I'm going to do an illustration for you, which I'm excited about. This is you. Here you are. You look pretty good. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're made in the image of God. But at some point in your life, you knew the right thing to do and you didn't do it. And you sinned. You fell short of the glory of God. And so sin then enters into your life. And you could not find a way to get rid of it on your own. You would try to cover it up. You would try to make yourself feel better through all sorts of different ways. You try to perhaps paint it. Uh, you try to move it around really fast so no one could really see what's going on. But no matter what, it was still there. And then we see, like we in John, in 1 John chapter 5, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And as we see in Acts, uh, in the later part of Acts and Paul's teachings or writings, 
that we were in the domain of Satan. So not only did you have sin within you, in addition to that, you're in a world that's controlled by, by Satan, by the father of lies. So now you have sin within, and you have Satan in a, having this whole world wrapped up in his lies. And no matter where you went, you, you were looking for solutions, looking for answers, and everywhere he found emptiness. There was, there was evil. There was no way out from being totally saturated in and out of unfulfilling uh, reality. And every different thing we tried to find an answer to this sin was just a different flavor of poison. But then, but then you heard the words of Christ. You heard the gospel, and upon hearing, you then had faith in what you heard. And from that faith, you believed and obeyed, and you were baptized, and something really amazing happened. And, let, and that amazing thing we're going to read in Colossians. So let's go to Colossians before we continue this. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to read a couple of verses as we prepare to conclude. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ." having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you, who were dead in your trespasses in the, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So what's taken place now is when you obeyed the gospel and you were baptized, what happens is you are no longer under, no longer under the power of Satan. And not only that, but the sin that was within you is completely removed. And upon being baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't just give you a clean slate. It's not just the removal of sin. It's also receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's something that's present now that wasn't there before in you. And when you're baptized, you are then added to the church, which is Christ's body. So not only are you now receiving the Spirit, you're now part of Christ. He is the king of all, the king of kings. And so you are now inside uh, his body as his body. You are now part of him. And when God looks at you, he doesn't just see you. He sees Christ. And God is over all and in all and through all. So not only that, you are also inside of God. Just as Jesus prays for us in the garden that we may all be one. Just as you are in me and I am in you, they may also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. So now you have the spirit within you and you are in Christ and you are one now with God. And I have to ask, a, I think, a pretty powerful question. How are you doing in there? Are you pretty safe? you pretty solid? How are you doing in there? We are protect, protected by being one with God 
and being one with each other. We are so protected. I was trying to think of a way to explain how protected we are in God from where we were before you, because our adversary is a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. But God, being with God, I was trying to think, how could I compare it to? What can I compare the protection we have of being right with God to the adversary we have. So it's like Satan is a roaring lion who seeking to be devour, and being with God is like a, a super aircraft carrier, and you live in the middle of it. It's fully armed and operational. And what do tooth and claw compare to, like, nuclear bombs? Like, it's just, he cannot touch you, like we read in 1 John chapter 5. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The one is born of God. The evil one cannot touch. The, the lion can't even get on the boat. He cannot even get on the boat. So listen to Romans 8, 36 through 39. And, oh, I, I tried to make the lion, like, actual size. I couldn't even shrink it down small enough just as a visual aid there. So listen to Romans 8, 36 to 35. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus uh, our Lord. So the three, the third point here, the first is so reminded, the second, second is being watchful. The third, a threefold cord. So go ahead and put your hands together, put your fingers together, and put your fingers together like so. This is a, if a threefold cord is not easily broken, look at what God has given us and how we are so intertwined with him. And if threefold cord cannot be easily broken, when we are with Christ and we are in Christ, it is in, we cannot be separated from God. So now number four. In, back in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, resist him firm in your faith. So firm, number four, do a chop, firm, like you're like laying it down, I'm firm, I'm serious, firm in your faith. The Greek word here is stereos, it means solid. It's the same word used as babies were wanting milk, you need salt, or you should be having solid food. That solid, that same word stereos, it's solid, it is firm. And our faith comes from hearing, and hearing from the word of Christ, as we talked about already in Romans 10, 17. Christ has told us and shared with us this. He's given, we, we didn't come to this on our own, but this, come, this understanding of where we are with God and what Christ has done with us comes exclusively from his word. We walk by faith, not by sight, we were told in Hebrews 10, 38 through 39, that the righteous one shall live by faith. And we are not the ones who shrink back and who are destroyed, um, but we persevere by living by faith. And then the last point I would like to make here, the last layer of defense is in the end of verse 9, which says, knowing the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the whole world, throughout the world. Several months ago at our Tuesday night men's group, which has always been a huge blessing, um, I had, there's about 18 or 20 of, of us there, and I had us all anonymously write out on cards things that we were struggling with. And there was an assortment of different things that people were struggling with, but what was amazing is that those things that they were, we were all struggling with we either had all struggled with before or we were also struggling with right now ourselves. There was nothing like, whoa, well, never had that problem before. Every single thing was something we had all experienced and could relate to. And Satan wants you to think that you are the only one struggling, suffering, the only one having a hard time. And the reality is we are all um, having to resist him and that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced through us at all. So he, we are not alone. That is being the thought of you are the only one suffering is a lie, and it comes from the father of lies. So this is number five, and it means that there are other people than you suffering, and that your brotherhood also suffering. So give somebody a high five. Is somebody else? So give somebody around you a high five. There you go. And so this is going to be that's your number five. That is not just you, but it can't, you can't high-five yourself. That's called clapping. We're not clapping. You have to high-five somebody else. So now, let's do a review. Let's go through this together, okay? And then we will be done. So number one, 
Let me see your number ones. So number one is being sober-minded, you know, clear thinking. Number two is to be watchful. Good, good job, good job. Number three, resist him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. Yeah, resist him. Now, number four, you got to be firm. There you go. Good job, good job. And now number five is a high five. You're not alone. You're connected to your brethren. We all are suffering in different ways. Don't think that you are alone. So understand that we, are to, we have adequate defense against Satan. Satan is real, but God is also real, and God is infinitely more powerful than Satan and has more than abundantly equipped us to be defended against our adversary. Being sober-minded and waking up to this is essential in our walk as Christians. So I want you to see that you have adequate layers of defense against our adversary, and all these layers of defense come exclusively from God. So the next time you high-five somebody, whether you're high-fiving a kid or somebody at work, remember, oh yeah, we have five layers of defense. And sometime today, go through them and, and try to remember them. And hopefully that will assist you in recalling that you are adequately defended to, to live a life of faith and love. If there's any needs here this morning or if anyone needs to be baptized, please come forward now while we stand and sing this next song.